welcome to another video. In this video we will discuss just what will it take for America to become a Christian nation again. And we know what you're thinking. And you're asking yourself this question. I thought we were a Christian nation already. In some aspect we are or we were. But American is heading for destruction unless the really true Christians get their head out of the sand and quit being deceived. And start really getting serious with reading their Bible for themselves. And get serious with God of heaven in some alone prayed time. Then changes will come. Now let us break it down for you. Now in the midst of the ongoing debates about Christian nationalism. There are two fundamental questions that need to be asked. First, what does it mean to be a Christian nation? And second, is or was America ever a Christian nation? Now how people answer these questions goes a long way in determining their attitude towards Christian nationalism. Do you remember back in 2006 when President Obama said that America was no longer just a Christian nation? In full, he said, given the increasing diversity of America's population, the dangers of sectarianism have never been greater. Whatever we once were, we are no longer just a Christian nation, we are also a Jewish nation, a Muslim nation, a Buddhist nation, a Hindu nation and a nation of non-believers. Then, in 2009, speaking in Turkey, he stated that we, he was speaking for himself and others and not us, Americans. Do not consider ourselves a Christian nation, or a Muslim nation, but rather, a nation of citizens who are, uh, bound by a set of values. Do you recall the outcry that followed? To paraphrase what many of you were thinking, what? America is not a Christian nation. Of course it is. And our country is just as certainly not a Muslim nation, like Saudi Arabia or Iran is now. Or they will do their best to make it into one if Christians do not stand up. In the picture Obama is at mosque prayer held every four years. In the White House. But he refuses to show up at the Christian National Day of Prayer because he was afraid to insult other religions. Looks like he is not afraid to insult other religions when it comes to praying with his Muslim brothers, Obama went to Egypt and declared we are no longer a Christian nation. Our founding colonies were explicitly Christian. Christian thinking informed our founding documents. Christian holidays are our national holidays. And the vast majority of our citizens profess to be Christians. Of course we consider ourselves to be a Christian nation. As articulated in a press release by Don Swarthout. President of Christians reviving America's values, when I actually heard our very own so-called President Biden who is supposed to be a Catholic. Saying the United States is not a Christian nation, we couldn't believe our ears. His statement is just not true and is a total fabrication on President Obama's part. Cause in fact Joe Biden. He is Obama's puppet. To quote further from the same press release, one of our current congressman Forbes said in May 2022, the overwhelming evidence suggests this nation was birthed with Judeo-Christian principles. We would challenge anybody to tell me that point in time when we cease to be so a Christian nation, because that time it doesn't exist. And when he did this he lost the seat in the Senate. When he went against Obama. And we are sure he knows why. And this, a columnist, Wayne Barrett said, but what is inescapable in what he President Obama keeps saying is the emphasis that the United States is not Christian. One would be hard-pressed to describe exactly how Islam, Hinduism, or Buddhism have helped shape America and its laws and culture. We lost Mr. Barrett in 2017. On the flip side, a 2012 article in the Los Angeles Times stated that, the National Association of Evangelicals said that when it surveyed selected evangelical leaders about whether the United States was a Christian nation, 68% said no. Much of the world refers to America as a Christian nation. But most of our Christian leaders don't think so, said Leith Anderson, the association's president. The Bible only uses the word Christian to describe people and not countries. Even those who say America is a Christian nation admit that there are lots of non-Christians and even anti-Christian beliefs and behaviors. In 2009, after highlighting both the unchristian and Christian elements in America's past and present, the left-leaning evangelical sojourner said this, this dichotomy is reminiscent of St. Augustine's teachings in The City of God. Essentially, in the book he teaches that no human institution, even the institution which calls itself the Church, can fully embody the teachings of Christ, but within these institutions are committed Christians who do God's will. This applies to America too. America is not a Christian nation, but there are followers of Christ within the country pushing the government and the nation to do the will of God. The only state, nation, principality, or country that can call itself a Christian nation is the kingdom of God fully ushered in by the second coming of Christ. 
What are Americans thinking today in 2022? What do they understand when we speak of our country being a Christian nation? Broadly speaking, do you agree with the statement that America is a Christian nation? Or do you believe that it was a Christian nation but no longer is? Or do you believe that no nation is truly Christian and a nation who turns it back on God of heaven? Will head for destruction and fall? Almost 12% voted for, it's a Christian nation. 41% cast their vote for, it was but isn't anymore. And 47% voted for, no nation is Christian. How interesting this fact is. To be sure, America today cannot possibly claim to be a truly Christian nation. When, when people have aborted more than 63 million babies since 1973. The world's leading provider of pornography by far. And have the highest rate of single-family homes in the world. Since the divorce rate among Christians and so-called preachers are comprising God's word. Plus have reportedly lead the world in illegal drug use and drug overdose deaths, while people are among the world leaders in categories such as crime rates, murder rates, rapes, and prisoners incarcerated. And it will only get worse if American turns its back on God of heaven. And this is only to look at the most obvious examples of people not being true Christians. As a 2013 article in Salon announced, eight appalling ways America leads the world, welcome to the new American exceptionalism, number one in obesity, guns, prisoners, anxiety, and more. Is this what a Christian nation is supposed to look like? According to Muslims in other parts of the world who thought that Christians were highly immoral and ungodly. They based their opinion on their knowledge of our filthiest Hollywood movies, our celebration of near-naked women on our magazine covers and our overall worldliness and carnality. The real Christians have had to explain to them that, in reality, most Americans are not Christian at all, even if many profess to be. They just to use God of heaven as a front in that sense of the term, and not true Christians at all. America is not a Christian nation, nor has it ever been. And you so-called Christians people are sending the wrong message to the world and they are watching. And you're going to be tested for what you believe. On the other hand, true Christians in India who get persecuted for their faith in Jesus Christ who say, India is now a Hindu nation, but they believe that one day it will be a Christian nation. By this they mean that the vast majority of the people will become true Christians, which would then be reflected in the government, in the laws, in the schools and in the media. Today, the opposite is true, as it is Hinduism that permeates the culture. In the same way, there are countries in Africa that are shifting from Islam, animism and tribal religion to Christianity, with Christians being elected to high government positions and schools becoming wide open to gospel influences. They want to see their nations become a true Christian country. Should people then want the same thing for America, especially in light of our origins? And is this what Christian nationalism is all about? These are the questions people must answer first in the debate over Christian nationalism. You should not force someone to believe in God of heaven. It takes away their free choice. God has given each person the choice to choose. To force someone is like ISIS killing Christians cause they will not renounce Jesus Christ. From our perspective, while no nation on earth will ever be fully Christian before Jesus returns. Cause most people are either deceived by man. Or have more faith in man. Than they do God of heaven. In America's past was much more a Christian nation than it is today. Despite all of people's major failings. And they're getting worse. In the past people trusted in God of heaven and his word and did not comprise the truth of God. And it would be good if people could be much more Christian in the future. If they ever learn to trust God in heaven instead of people. And put his words into action. But that to me, is something different than, Christian nationalism. And you're asking yourself. Okay. What will it take for America to become a Christian nation again? Well. If America becomes a Christian nation once again, it will come, from, we the people. It will not come from politicians in Washington D.C. Now consider the following facts. America was considered a Christian nation for the first 150 years of her existence, not because of an act of Congress or judicial decree, but because of the organic faith of the vast majority of her inhabitants. This faith of, we the people, flowed upward and influenced all the cultural and government institutions of the nation. The First Great Awakening This remarkable Christianizing of the American populace was the fruit of the First Great Awakening, which may be dated from 1726 to 1770. So many turned to Christ in this remarkable revival that critical mass was achieved, and the revival's influence was felt everywhere. 
As a result, the Continental Congress opened each session with prayer and Christian chaplains were appointed to the military and to Congress. George Washington took the first presidential oath of office with his hand on the sacred book of Christians, the Bible. When studying the religious beliefs of George Washington, it is difficult to make absolute, concrete conclusions. Depending on the source examined, Washington has been painted in differing lights ranging from a deist to a believing Christian. Washington was the great, great-grandson of Lawrence Washington, an Anglican pastor. Washington declared a national day of prayer and thanksgiving to God. In regard to personal spirituality, Washington was generally private about his religious life. Washington is reported to have had regular private prayer sessions, and personal prayer was a large part of his life. One well-known report stated that Washington's nephew witnessed him doing personal devotions with an open Bible while kneeling, in both the morning and evening. It is clear that when it came to religion, Washington was a private man, more so than with other aspects of his life. Washington did see God as guiding the creation of the United States. Washington was a humanitarian. He helped to care for the poor and believed strongly in charity, which he exercised privately. America was a Christian nation, not by an act of Congress, but by the faith-filled actions of her citizenry. John Marshall, the second Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, understood this. Serving as Chief Justice for 34 years from 1801 to 1834, Marshall wrote. The American population is entirely Christian, and with us Christianity and religion are identified. It would be strange, indeed, if with such a people, our institutions did not presuppose Christianity, and did not refer to it, and exhibit relations with it. The Second Great Awakening America has experienced at least three great awakenings that have impacted the values and cultural direction of the nation. Each one served to restore Christian faith during times of spiritual indifference and apostasy. The Second Great Awakening happened in 1801-1840, for example, reversed the negative influences of deism and the French Revolution that had gained ascendancy during latter days of the 18th century. The American historian, Dr. Mark Knoll, called the Second Great Awakening, the most influential revival in the history of the United States. Peter Cartwright, a circuit-riding Methodist clergyman, wrote of this revival, saying, The work went on and spread almost in every direction, gathering additional force, till our country seemed all coming to God. The Third Great Awakening has been called, the Great Prayer Awakening of 1857-1858. This Great Prayer Revival touched every part of American society. Churches and public halls became filled night and day with people pouring out their hearts to God in prayer. The Third Great Awakening in 1880-1910 was characterized by new denominations and very active missionary work. You might remember this scene from the movie, O oh Brother Where Art Thou? Presidents Franklin Pierce from 1853 to 1857 and James Buchanan from 1857 to 1861 attended prayer meetings that were organized in Washington, D.C. The famous revivalist, Charles G. Finney, said that, a divine influence seemed to pervade the whole land, the Great Prayer Awakening of 1857 to 1858. A fervent prayer continued throughout the Civil War, saving the nation from total ruin. President Abraham Lincoln in 1861 to 1865, for example, told of his prayer response when he heard that General Robert E. Lee was marching into Pennsylvania with 76,000 Confederate troops. With everyone panicking, Lincoln went into his office, closed the door and got down on his knees. As he poured out his heart to God, the answer came in a clear and distinct manner. He said, a sweet comfort crept into my soul that God Almighty had taken the whole business into his own hands. Lee was defeated at the Battle of Gettysburg, and it proved to be the turning point of the war. The Battle of Gettysburg was fought between July 1 and July 3, 1863. It was one of the bloodiest battles of the United States Civil War, with over 51,000 casualties, soldiers killed, injured, or otherwise lost to action, combined. Around 3,100 U.S. troops were killed, while 3,900 Confederates died. The U.S. victory there marked the turning point of the war. Here is Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, as inscribed on the Lincoln Memorial, it says. Four score and seven years ago our fathers brought forth, on this continent, a new nation, conceived in liberty, and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation, or any nation so conceived, and so dedicated, can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field, as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives, that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But, in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, 
We cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow, this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here, have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note, nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they here gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. The American Union was saved. The Supreme Court recognizes our Christian character. In 1892, the U.S. Supreme Court declared America to be a Christian nation, not because of an act of Congress, but because of these awakenings, and numerous local and regional revivals, that had impacted the faith of the people. In the ruling, Church of the Holy Trinity v. the United States, the nation's highest court declared. The churches and church organizations which abound in every city, town, and hamlet, the multitude of charitable organizations existing everywhere under Christian auspices, the gigantic missionary associations, with general support, and aiming to establish Christian missions in every quarter of the globe. These, and many other matters which might be noticed, add a volume of unofficial declarations to the mass of organic utterances that this is a Christian nation. Notice that the court did not decree America to be a Christian nation by judicial fiat, but merely acknowledged the fact that American was a Christian nation because of the pervasive, organic faith of her citizens who actually stood up for what they believed in. Where are the so-called Christians now? Mostly of them are sitting back on the sidelines doing nothing. And being controlled by the government. Now the true and only clear path to being a Christian nation. Is this. Now listen and listen good. For those who want America to once again be a Christian nation, now it will not happen via a political route. And it will not happen by an act of Congress. And furthermore. It will not come by an executive order from the White House. Because that is the old Constantinian approach and is the politicized form of Christianity. That our ancestors fled from in Europe. For you who do not this. Constantinian Christians reserve for themselves the right to participate in actions, some of which can be deemed immoral, because they claim moral superiority, a moral superiority defined through the negation of those who question or fight against the interests of the United States. They are terrorists. They cannot be reasoned with. They are inhuman in their actions. Because we are not them, therefore, we are civilized, rational, and humane. We may make mistakes or participate in poor judgment, but our actions will never be perceived as immoral because, after all, we are who we are, a Christian nation. It will come by humbling yourself before God in your prayer closet. This how the great people of God did it and you're no different. American was a Christian nation because of the pervasive, organic faith of her citizens. Where are these so-called Christians of today? Most of them are sitting back on the sidelines doing nothing. And the real ones are praying. But some are pushing it back on God of heaven to do something while they sit on their backside. Now prayer is good in certain situations. When you do not know what to do. Or people think it is not God's will to do this or that. But the word of God tells you what to do and some of people will not do it. Where is their faith in God of heaven? You have to believe before you see. Faith without works is dead. Either you believe God in heaven is with you or you do not it is plain and simple. There is no excuse. There is no go-between. And do not blame God of heaven. For what happens if you sit and do nothing? Put it like this if you fight you will win either way. So we asked you what are you afraid of then? Now if you have fear. You got it from the devil. And not from God in heaven. As the scripture says in 2 Timothy states in verses 1-7. to for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. We are totally certain without a doubt that America's founders would approve this message. Many of America's greatest leaders have been influenced by the teachings of the Bible, and biblical verses can be found in many of their speeches and quotes now preserved on D.C.'s monuments. Carved in stone. The Washington Monument. In addition to the two stones, there is also a Bible in the cornerstone and the aluminum cap bears the inscription, Laos Deo, Praise God. These words have been there for many years, they are 555 feet, 5,125 inches high, perched atop the monument, facing skyward to the father of our nation, overlooking the 69 square miles which comprise the District of Columbia, capital of the United States of America. 
Just so people know that in 2007 during George W. Bush's administration told the National Park Service to remove the inscription on the display of the Washington Monument. At the request of Pastor Todd DeBoard of Lake Allmanor Community Church. But it has been. Restored since then. The Lincoln Memorial, for example, displays two of Lincoln's quotes, each of which was chosen to remind the reader of Lincoln's lasting influence on the country. One of these quotes comes from Lincoln's second inaugural address and includes two direct Bible quotations, Matthew 18 verse 7 and Psalm 19 verse 9. In choosing this speech to be a part of the monument, its designers were acknowledging the role religion played in Lincoln's life and policies, especially as it related to his understanding of the Civil War. Lincoln's second inaugural address inside the Lincoln Memorial. The Bible verses are highlighted. The Washington Monument and the Lincoln Memorial are just two examples of how the Bible is memorialized in the city's stone. There are many others. We encourage you to explore the Bible's presence in these and other monumental sites across Washington, D.C., that the current leaders are so overlooking in denial and it proves Obama was wrong. Cause American was founding on godly principles. You had the Ten Commandments and you claimed people do not have to follow them since Jesus Christ came to earth, but Jesus Christ said in in Matthew 5 verses 17 to 19. In verse 17 he says do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. And furthermore. So look at the laws. That are all broken and innocents lives that have been killed. Since they have taken them out of the government's places. And schools. And people make up their own laws as they go. And they will push for one world currency just to take, in God we trust off the us currency. So much racism going on it makes our hearts so hurt and sick. To see so many young people are being so disrespectful to their parents and people are pushing so hard for division of people. Do you not see the problems here? Jesus plainly said he did not come to destroy the law. The Greek word translated destroy, Greek, katalio, can also be translated dissolve, demolish, abrogate or deprive of force. Instead of abolishing the law, he came to fulfill, pleuro, it, which means to make full, fill up or accomplish. Not only did he come to fulfill Old Testament prophecies, he also came to perfectly obey the Ten Commandments and, by doing so, fill them with greater meaning and relevance, just as the Messiah was prophesied to do, Isaiah 42 verse 21. We will dig deeper on another video coming soon. Back to our topic. No one can deny that many of the founding fathers of the United States of America were men of deep religious convictions based in the Bible and faith in Jesus Christ. And they did not promote the things the current president is doing like abortions, same-sex marriages, and all kinds of sins. Promoting wars. And stealing from the American people. These are the founders of our country and we should be proud they made the way for us Christians today. They fought for the very freedoms we have to fight to keep that they are trying to take away from us. And they are blaming it all on God of heaven. In this day and time. And. Founding fathers they did not go out looking for trouble outside the USA. And they did exactly what they said they would do. And they showed the most respect for soldiers who die in the wars that were fought. Unlike today. When presidents swear into office. They place their hand on the Bible and swear to support the Constitution of the United States. Many presidents made this oath on the word of God that they know nothing about. Those who isolate religion from government, business and school are attempting to destroy Christianity. By trying to make America free from religion, instead of freedom of religion, they tried to destroy a nation. And the people who opposed their trash. And we will leave you with this prayer from. George Washington. Our first president of the USA. Who never forgot God of heaven. Almighty God, we make our earnest prayer that Thou wilt keep the United States in Thy holy protection, that Thou wilt incline the hearts of the citizens to cultivate a spirit of subordination and obedience to government, and entertain a brotherly affection and love for one another and for their fellow citizens of the United States at large. And finally that Thou wilt most graciously be pleased to dispose us all to do justice, to love mercy, and to demean ourselves with that charity, humility, and pacific temper of mind which were the characteristics of the divine author of our blessed religion, and without a humble imitation of whose example in these things we can never hope to be a happy nation. Grant our supplication, we beseech thee, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We thank you for taking the time out of your day to watch this video. It is hoped you will share this. To every sister, brother, father, mother or friend.
they will not find offense because you have given them a lesson in history that they probably never learned in school. With that, be not ashamed or afraid, but we pray for those who will never see. Thanks again God bless always.